if somebody's watching this, they're listening to this, and they're feeling lost, they're feeling hopeless, they're in like the, the depths of despair, like what's your message to them? Give me the highlight reel. I mean, straight up, I just tell people my slogan, I'm never give up, never quit, you know? I was given the chance to live through my injuries, so I make the most of every situation. And a lot of times people don't have that constant reminder that I have or have been through the same traumatic injuries that I have been through. So it's harder for them to see the positivity out there. Not that my story or my, my situation is any worse than anybody else's. I just think that I have been given a gift where I can see what could have happened and I can see also how fortunate I was to make it through. Before we go any further, talk to me about that day. Talk about April 10th, 2012. Talk about what you were doing. Talk about I guess summarize what happened and we can take it from there. I was with the 82nd Airborne Division um, out of Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I was on my third trip over to Afghanistan. I didn't actually have to go on that deployment. Uh, the big army, you know, reached out and said, hey, we're going to send you somewhere else. You already got over two years of combat. And I was like, yeah, this doesn't work that way. My guys are going, I got to go. And my wife understood the calling and my daughter was only four months old, but I deployed. And then we were over there. We mixed it up with the Taliban pretty good daily. And then on April 10th of 2012, we just so happened to go on patrol. And I was in charge of the big guns. So I was a weapon squad leader that is, was my title or position. And I had the big 240 Bravo machine guns I was in charge of. And the Taliban didn't really care for me or my guys because every time we got into a, a firefight, we were just ripping them up. And instead of booby trapping stuff inside the city, they started going out to where they thought we would be. Because usually the weapon squad, they're just caught in the middle. You know, there's people in front, people in back. You're, like, protected. But we came to a short halt and had a, got the mine super sweep the ground. with uh, I had what they call GPR, ground penetrating radiation or something. G, yeah, GPR. They would see if there's any soil that were messed up. And nothing alarmed us. So took my backpack off, about 120 pounds, full of ammo, grenades, uh, 203 grenades, you know, 40 mic mic. Um, grenades and um, water and stuff and I set it on the ground and it landed on top of a bomb and when the bomb went off it took my right arm and right leg instantly I actually got thrown on the left side of my face I can remember vividly I got thrown on the left side of my face I rolled over I saw the aftermath and right leg and arm were gone disintegrated they never found those pieces of me uh, my left arm was blown out at the wrist but I still had to use my thumb and index and middle finger and my left leg was snapped to the bone, so just muscle and tendon and skin holding it on. It hit the ground, rolled over, saw everything, and then instantly my medic was on me. And I was like, hey, don't worry about it, not going to save me. And I told him, like, go save my guys. I had two guys yelling for the medic that got hit as well. You know, he ignored that and worked on me. Him and my platoon sergeant and Sergeant Hambright were putting tourniquets on me to stop the bleeding. So every limb had a tourniquet as tight as they could put it in another one. While they were working on me, I kept thinking, like, just don't scream out in pain. Don't show any weakness. I was always the first in a firefight, last out. I never really showed any fear. Uh, one time, I, I, I actually, I actually uh, irritated myself. I had a sniper around cracked six, six inches from my head. Between me and my lieutenant, they were chesting in snipers, and it cracked right between our heads, and I, I rolled in. And I was so mad at myself for, like, rolling away that I jumped up on top of a berm and dumped a magazine and a half to the area that I was pretty sure he shot me for, or shot at me from. Again, I just I told myself, don't, don't show any weakness or fear right now. And no matter what happens, it's out of my hands. So the worst thing I can do is have my last memories for my guys be me crying out, you know, begging not to die or, you know, freaking out about the situation. You know, my medics are working on me. My med one medic and my platoon sergeant, I radio my lieutenant with my left hand. I tell him I need his medic with ours. We got guys hit. So he sends over his medic to our element. Um, Doc Voice worked on the other two guys. Then he works on me. Stern my V in the chest. Only way I could get entropy was stern my V right through my, you know, right to my chest is only part that hurt actually weirdly enough like nothing else hurt i wasn't in any real pain except when they took that big old needle and they just like you know tomahawked into my chest about 10 minutes after doc voice got there they put me on a helicopter with the other two guys ryan and brandon and flew us to the hospital and then i went into the hospital and i was going down the hallway and i honestly I kept trying to sit up and every time i'd get to my left elbow i'd throw myself forward and the nurse would push me down and i kept you know Try and do it again. The third time, I told her to quit touching me. I said, I just got to get my feet back underneath me. I got to go back to my guys. Like, you know, uh, I'm good. Let me go. And she's like, Sergeant Mills, you know, I'm not still awake, but you need to go to sleep. And she knocked me out. And when she knocked me out, like, the last thing I said to her was, my little girl, I'm never going to see her again because my daughter was just only six months old. And at that point, I was losing all my ability to have any control of the situation. You know, the only thing I thought about was, like, my daughter – 
am I ever going to see her again? How is this, you know, what's going to happen next? And they knocked me out. And then nine doctors and seven nurses worked on me continuously for 14 hours, which is impressive in itself because, and I use that for some motivation because they could have loosened up one tourniquet and I would have bled out in two minutes or less. But instead they gave me blood from their veins because the blood bank ran out of A positive and universal blood that day. So they were taking blood from their veins as well as have people run to the hospital doors to get blood to me from them, um, which incredible. So after the surgeries, I was a triple amputee because I still had my left arm that day. 14 hours, I was critical, but as, like, stable enough, you know, it was still considered critical. That's kind of that day. Wow, man. Thank you so much for, for sharing all that. And I, I can't imagine how scary and emotional and sad, like everything, all the, all the feelings that must have gone through your mind and your body that day, given what you went through. I'm curious, people might be listening to this and they might be trying to figure out how do I relate to this? Like I, I'm, I'm inspired by your story, but I wasn't in the military. I haven't lost any of my limbs. Um, my life's challenging now, but I, I just don't know how this relates. Talk about some of the emotions you were feeling when you got kind of back to center, when the surgery was done, you were fully like aware of what was going on. Talk about what those emotions were like. So I woke up four days later um, in Germany and you know, I woke up there not realizing what the full extent of my injuries were. So my brother-in-law was in the room. He's in the military. And uh, he was in the room because before you deploy, you fill out paperwork and basically you plan your funeral. And it's kind of pretty morbid. I had to do it three times. But on the bottom of the paper, it says, who escorts your body home, if anybody? I always put him to take me home, uh, to take me home or I, he put me to take him home. So I woke up in Germany and he was in the room. And I looked over and I, you know, first thing I said was my soldiers, how are my soldiers? Because always mission first. And I think... I think that's what kept me so calm was I wasn't concerned for myself. I was concerned about my guys and having them have a memory of me if I died screaming out in pain and stuff like that. So I asked about my soldiers and he told me, you know, Ryan's here. Um, Brandon's back in Kandahar. But, he, you know, I took most of the blast, he said. And then I said, okay. And then I said, am I paralyzed? And he said, no. And I had told him, I said, I can't put my fingers to toes. So like, you can tell me the truth. Am I paralyzed? And he said, no, man, you, you're not paralyzed, but you don't have them anymore. And then the only thing I said was, oh. And then for three hours, I ignored everybody, right? I looked at the ceiling. A doctor or a nurse or a Josh would try talking to me. Look, they'd get my line of sight and ask me a question. And I'd just turn my head the other way. Because in my head, I have my own questions, right? Like, am I a bad person? You know, does God hate me? What did I do wrong in life to deserve this? Bigger question is how can I still be a husband and a father? Not that I was suicidal, but the biggest question I had on repeat was why didn't I just die? And it's not because I didn't want to live, but it's like, what do I have left to offer? And I think... My story relating to people, I think we've all, you know, been through something where we've had to ask, like, why this happened? You know, why me? Whether that's a financial thing or anxiety thing or a car accident or whatever. And what I like to tell people is, you know, your biggest problem is your biggest problem. And you shouldn't compare your problems to my problems because we all go through something different and we all walk a different, you know, path in life. So if my story can help people, I'm, I'm cool with it. Like, that's what I do. I like to give back and help and help people with perspective and resiliency. And I, I'm actually, I'm a pretty, pretty well, uh, well-known speaker throughout the nation. I, I do a lot of corporate events and I make sure that everybody knows, like you can't compare yourself to my military story, but the emotions and the feelings of how can I be a father and a husband? What do I have left to offer? How do I not be a burden on somebody? You know, that's, that's all real, you know, real and relatable. I want to go back to something you said, you know, you talked about like one of your biggest fears when you were like laying down after the IED had just gone off, you were worried about like crying in front of your fellow soldiers and, and worrying about like the last memories they have of you is you crying. Fast forward now, you've written this book and a lot of it's about vulnerability and compassion and trauma, like all this stuff that I think is kind of the opposite of that. Do you still feel that way now? Like, do you look back and knowing that you've done all this work on yourself and you're putting out all this great content on being vulnerable, do you still see crying like during your last moments of life as something that's bad? Well, no, I, I didn't mean like crying. I mean like crying out in pain or like oh, okay. begging for my life. Like what I tell people and it was true at the time and everything is that, you know, I, I always watch military movies. I love them. Still to this day, I love them. Like the outpost, the Netflix, it was on Netflix there. It's like the most realistic firefight sounds I've ever heard in a movie. But my thing was, I always thought about when the medic dies in Saving Private Ryan. He begs for his mom, right? He 
says, I just want to go home, begs for his life, and ultimately he dies. And I told myself, that would be a terrible memory for my guys to have if I was begging to go home and begging not to die. And ultimately I died. So, I mean, you know, I didn't show any fear and that's just who I am and how I was. I still, I still kind of live that way. And I, I'm the first to admit, I did mental health the wrong way. And it, it, well, I, I, cause I'd go back and do it the same way, but I'm the first to admit I didn't do it right by any standard. Um, mental health came in the first time I was sleeping. I woke up, my wife told me, Hey, mental health came to see you today. And I said, uh, you can tell them not to come back. I'm not talking to him. She came in the second time and I closed my eyes and pretended to sleep as she was trying to like talk to me. And she didn't know, you know, she thought I was just sleeping. And the third time she came back, I was eating a bowl of cereal sitting up with a makeshift arm. Like we're talking split material, duct tape, uh, a spoon duct taped on the split material. And I looked over at her and I might have said this, I might have said the S word. And I said, oh, sh-, you know. And I fell back my, from sitting up, staring her right in the eyes, fell back in my bed and pretended like I was sleeping. And she walked over and I gave her my name, rank, and my social. And she's like, what? And she asked me another question. I gave her my name, rank, and social security number again because that's what you tell the enemy if you get captured. And I told her that. I said, look, we're not talking. We're not friends. We're not going to do this. That's, that was my extent of, of mental health that I did. You know what I mean? So there's no reason for me to lie to anybody about how I went about it. I think I had a lot of strength through community. And I had a lot of families that were going through the same thing Kelsey and I were going through. So we still today have six families that we're very close with. The reason I started the foundation, the Travis Mills Foundation, was because it was a chance for people to bond over their injury, for families to see other families going through what they're going through, and to have that connection where everybody's just going to instantly understand, like, I know what you guys go through. I get it. This is a very long-winded way of saying, like, I don't regret how I felt. I wouldn't change how I did it because it's how I did it. But the reason I wrote this book was because as I speak to people throughout the nation, uh, everybody has a story. And they want to come up and tell me, like, hey, I go, I, I'm going through this. It's nothing like you, but I'm going through this. And I'm like, no, that's valid. That's why in my book, Bounce Back, I put a lot of stories in there. You know, a house fire, a cancer survivor, a widower, you know, just all these different stories of people, post-traumatic stress. You know, a guy that has post-traumatic stress uh, that, was, that was crippling, you know, terrible with anger issues and all that. So I put those stories in there because I want to relate to everybody. And I want everybody to understand, like, you know, you don't have to lose your arms and legs to be able to, to go forward in life or have a positive attitude. I mean, everybody has problems. And when I talk to everybody in the audiences, you know, there's usually, like I was in Vegas a couple of weeks ago and there's like, I think 3,000, 4,000 people in the room. And five or six are like, hey, I'm actually battling cancer right now. And one guy was like, my cancer's terminal. It's been that way for three years. You know, I just take every day as I can. But your story really, it's really relatable. And I think that's that's what I try to do. So you mentioned that a lot of the emotions that are relatable to people are like these, the feelings of what do I have left to offer? Am I going to be a good husband? Am I going to be a, a good um, father? Or like feeling worthless and all this stuff. And I think people definitely feel that way when they're going through hard times in life, when they're going through adversity. And I think what can really help them get out of that is these like small wins, which I know you talk a lot about. What were some of the small wins for you from, you had the surgery, you're in Walter Reed for what, like 19 months, I think you said. What were some of the things that really helped you start to rebuild some confidence? I'm not going to kid anybody out there. Like, uh, I'm a pretty prideful person. And when I saw my wife for the very first time, to have a real conversation in person, like on April 18th, um, after I just had surgery when I got back, like I told her she should leave. I said, look, I have nothing left to offer. I'm not the six foot three, you know, athletic jock, if you will, guy that can pick anything up and do everything. I said, I'm literally here having people help feed me and use the restroom. Like Corman had to help me go to the bathroom. So I said, you should take what we have, the house, the cars, any money saved up, it's yours. And I said, financially, whatever we have is yours as well. And for you and Chloe, I want nothing but the best. But I literally don't see how I'm going to be a benefit to you. And I told her she should take what we have and go. And, um, you know, that's a lot. That's a lot. She was 23. I was 25. So we had a six-month-old. I mean, she was like, no, nah, no, nah, we'll get, we're going to get through this together. So she's a huge factor in why I got better. And I was able to just base my recovery off of, well, she's not leaving. I'm going to keep pushing forward. And the small wins were, you know, at first being able to sit up by myself. I lost 110 pounds in those, those seven days. And I was so weak, I lost my muscle mass. So I couldn't roll right or left or sit up by myself. So I got to do that again. Um, then it was workout. And then it was get an arm. Five weeks into my recovery, I got my very first prosthetic arm. So I drank a Gatorade and I ate some lasagna, fed myself. Then it was, I want to start walking. So just shy of two months, I had my first trip around the military advanced training center's little track on short legs. 
but it was all these little things. And then I found out that I'm required to do one hour of physical therapy, one hour of occupational therapy. But as soon as I got healthy enough, I was going four hours of each every day, five days a week, 40 hours a week. My recovery was my job. And it was time to get going. And, you know, after, and not every day was a win, you know, like not every day was like, oh, look at me, I'm progressing. Like there was days where I couldn't do anything. The first day I walked, I did three laps. My dad missed it because he was, my dad got so dehydrated. He got diverticulitis and had to have surgery when I got blown up. So he's got a reversal done and he missed the first day I walked. So the next day I walked, I said, dad, I'm going to walk five laps. I'm going to show you I can do five laps. I got half lap around and my legs cramped up and muscle spasms. I fell over and I couldn't, I mean, I could not bring myself to move anymore, you know? So it was a setback, but I think with all things in, you know, resiliency based or pushing forward, you're not going to have every day be a victory, but that's okay. You got to just make sure that the next day you try again. I know one of the big milestones, I think in, in your recovery was being able to see like your guys and the medic that saved your life on your birthday. Talk a bit about that and um, what that experience meant to you. Uh, on my birthday, I woke up in Montreal, Germany. That's when I found out I had no arms and legs. And my brother-in-law kept trying to talk to me, the doctors and nurses, and I kept ignoring them. And after three hours, he's like, hey, man, look, I'm not going to pretend like I know what you're going through. We got to call your parents. You got to call your wife. You got to call. You know, you got to make these calls. So I did. But they were very brief conversations. But I knew my guys were still overseas. They're still worried about me. Yeah, I, this is not supposed to be arrogant or cocky or toot my own horn, but like I was, I was a pretty good leader, right? I was young for the position I was in. I always got promoted above everybody that was my age, and I was put in positions higher than people that had like a lot more years than me because I was good at my job. I took care of my soldiers. So my biggest worry was my guys are worried about me, and they're just you know wondering what I got going on. So I told Josh find my unit's number, and we called my unit. My guys in the middle of nowhere, uh, found a way to call them. I talked to all of them, told them, thanks for your quick actions, your hard work. I appreciate you. You did a great job. They told me about the missions that they were doing um, after I was injured, how they they paid it back tenfold for me and all this stuff. And it was it was good, right? I had no sadness in my voice. I, you know, I just masked all that. And it was like, hey, get after it. Don't worry about me. I'm good because all you guys did. And that said, I'll be there when you get home. And they flew back in mid-August. And I had just got my legs approved that day to take home. And I drove three and a half, or I'm sorry, six and a half hours to my house in North Carolina, changed into my uniform on prosthetics, very hard to do. Then I went to the, the base and I got to meet my guys when I got off the plane and give them a high five and a handshake and a hug and have my prosthetics on and just say, hey, welcome home. Thank you. You know, and it was cool. I got to see the medic, you know, and not jump ahead in the story, but my wife and I are fortunate where we have a second child and... Yeah, uh, a little boy. His name is Dax, uh, and we named him after the medics, Daniel and Alexander. We just put their names together, uh, came up with D A X, and my son, because they made it possible for him to live and have more children, is named after them. It's a beautiful way for things to to come full circle. I want to jump a little ahead. I know I think it was roughly what, like a year and a half after the accident, was like your true. I guess rock bottom. Like I was shocked when reading that, like the, the, that day where the IED went off, like wasn't rock bottom. But it seems like rock bottom was when things all kind of came to a head for you, like emotionally, and you were really just battling with what had transpired and battling with your identity and everything. Talk a bit about where you were at that time in your life and like how you began to to reinvent yourself from there. Yeah, I mean, I was. Uh... Like in high school, right? I mean, I'm going to back up and go in ebbs and flows here. But when I was in high school, I was a varsity captain of the baseball team, sophomore, junior, senior year. I was a varsity captain of the football and basketball team, juniors and senior years, right? Went to college, and I was a redshirt freshman. I was a nobody, which is fine, right? I was an all-time high in high school. Went to college. I was a nobody. Didn't like college. Went to the Army. Started as a nobody. Built myself up as Staff Sergeant Travis Mills, leader of combat soldiers. All my NCOARs which basically report cards, if you will, or job performances were all like promote right away. So I was probably going to pick up my E7 quick. I uh, had it all mapped out my life, 20 years in the military, crossover, be an officer soon, you know, had it all mapped out. Then I got blown up. And then I was at the bottom of the barrel of who am I and what do I have left to offer anybody and how's my life going to go? And then I started working out. I was older at 25 to be injured. So a lot of the younger guys that get hit are like 18, 19, 20. So they looked up to me and the hospital recognized that I was a very positive person just in general. And they would say like, Hey, we got a guy upstairs, just came in, missed both legs. Can't tell you cause of HIPAA, like the room number, but he's not in 40. 
He's not in 42, but somewhere between there you might find him. And, you know, and then it turned into like, hey, we have PFC Johnson upstairs in room 41. You know, this is his injuries. And at Walter Reed, I became somebody, somebody that people respected, looked up to, asked for a question, you know, asked for help on things. And I was a mentor. And it was cool, right? I mean, I wasn't searching it out. I wasn't trying to find a purpose, but it was cool. But then I got out of the military and the military is like, hey, you know, I, all I wanted was to retire. I'm not going to say pretend like I wasn't trying to get out of there. So I just wanted to retire, get out of my life. Then I got retired and I was so worried no one's going to make my like my retirement ceremony. I was like, man, maybe maybe no one's going to come. Like, I was like, Ugh, I'm not sure they're going to show up. Well, you know, like 600 people came and it was like, it was tremendous. It was amazing that uh, they all came and we all had a nice story. They all had something nice to say about what I did for them or their patient or, you know, whatever. Just really, really nice. I appreciated that. Then I went to my in-laws house that, that later that day. I got home and I was thinking about it and I was like, man, who, who am I? You know, like, I'm no longer in the military, you're right? I'm not the leader of combat soldiers, which I thought my life was going to be. I'm not a Walter Reed where everybody looks up to me and asks me questions and needs me for things. And now I'm sitting here in Texas, fully retired. What am I going to even do? And my wife came in and I was like sobbing, crying. And I never let my emotions out like that before. And I just had no idea what I was going to do because I, mean, I was like, what, I have 27 you know, like, it's not like I was ready to be retired. Luckily, I had great friends that did a documentary that, you know, they did a documentary first and became great friends with them. And they helped us start a foundation while we were still at Walter Reed. Uh, I started my first, writing my first book. And I started speaking a little bit here and there. And I started working out with my friend David from Adapt Training Foundation, David Fabora. And I just slowly rebuilt my community. And I slowly found that I still had purpose. And I had to find my direction in life. But yeah, the bottom of the barrel was when I was sitting there and there was nobody, nobody told me what I had to do. And I had no, no idea, no idea, no clue what I was going to do. I know one of the big themes of your latest book and a, a theme of what you talk a lot about is like the idea of post-traumatic growth, the hero's journey, turning pain into purpose, right? And you talked about how you started to speak, share your story. You talked about in, in present day, how you speak, you know, you know, all over the place, you got the foundation, you're talking on podcasts like this, what's been the most meaningful thing for you as far as like turning all of that pain into purpose? I, I enjoy the fact that I could live independently. You know, like I was given the chance to have prosthetic legs that are Bluetooth that I can drive with. So I take my daughter, like today I took my daughter to school, right? My, my wife and kids went to New Zealand for uh, a vacation. I didn't want to go. I had work to do. And that's just an excuse because it's a lot of hills and I was like, ah, I'm cool. But like, I drove down to the airport to get my daughter because she wanted to ride home with me. My son's a mama's boy right now. We're working on it. <laughs> but I think the coolest thing is that I can help people understand that no matter what life is going to go on, and I can help them understand that we all have problems. And not to put my problems on a pedestal and definitely don't minimize, you know, like, don't minimize your problems because of what I went through. But making sure that people understand, like, life is going to keep going. Like, I sat in the hospital bed, not that I wanted to die, but... You know what I mean? You can't just sit there and be like, all right, cool. I'm done. Like, we're good. Let's call it. Shut the lights off. Uh, I'm, I'm cool with dying right now. Like, you can't do that. I had to realize, like, there's no way but forward. And people wonder how I'm so positive. I tell a lot of jokes and have a good time. And people are like, oh, my gosh, how are you so positive? And it's like, well, I literally had two choices, get better or don't. And I won't let my family down. So my daughter was my biggest guiding light for me. We learned how to walk together, right? She was six months old when I got blown up. By the time I started walking more proficiently, she was just taking her first steps. And I had videos of her holding my prosthetic arm as I was walking around the gym with her. And, uh, you know, she's she's awesome. You know, it, it's just cool. I get to share my story and people can relate to it. Speaking of humor, I know a lot of times people can use laughter and humor as a way to, like, hide and escape from from pain. Have you ever dealt with that? No, you know, people wonder if I do that just because I don't want to talk about stuff because I'm not a very serious person. But what I use humor for is to make everyone feel comfortable. Like say I go to speak in an event and they have a cocktail hour before and they invite me down and I'm like, yeah, no problem. I'll come. There's like three or four people in the room that are in on me being the speaker and they'll come talk to me. Everybody else, very standoffish. Like, oh, geez. What if I say the wrong thing? Oh my gosh. Like what happened to that guy? Like I don't want to stare. As soon as I get up on stage and I start my presentation off with, Man, I'm so excited to be here, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for having me. But I'll be honest, I'm a little bit nervous. I just hope I don't bomb this, you know, because last time. And then I tell a few more, like, jokes. And I have, like, highs and lows. People laugh. They cry. 
But once I open up with, with the humor, it helps everybody else around me relax. And I find I don't use it to deflect any of my emotions, right? I am who I am. I've been this way my whole life. But it helps people open up to me and to see me as, you know, Travis Mills, not as a guy with no arms, no legs, if that makes sense, right? They look past my injuries, if you will. So when you're sharing your story and you're speaking at these events, like what part of your story or your presentation would you say gets you and the audience the most emotional? I mean, I don't really get emotional too much, uh, but about the kids, right? What Kelsey went through, my wife making the decision to stay or go, the fact that I had family, like I had a young family, that stuff, you know, the blow up scene. I mean, I have like a recreation of the blow up scene that gets people. So I don't know. And then they all get excited for the foundation. Kelsey and I started the Travis Mills Foundation just off of an idea to do care packages. Now it's like one of the top veteran service organizations in the nation that brings out combat and service connected to injured veterans and their families, as well as we have a post traumatic stress program. Uh, for anybody listening, I know this is a shameless plug, but if you have a military combat veteran or a first responder going through post traumatic stress, we have a program called Warrior Path. It's free to those people, and they can come and be part of the program. They just got to go to the website and get involved. But it's got to be a first responder or a combat veteran for the post traumatic stress program called Warrior Path. It's really good, but. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think just people can relate to like being a dad or being, you know, a mom or things like that. Or even, even you know, having a son or daughter or niece or nephew or somebody in the military, right? Like I talk to people that were just crying because like their kid's about to deploy or just joined the military and they, they just can't believe what my family must have went through. Like my mom and dad, my sister and brother, everybody. I heard you uh, talk about, or maybe I, th I think I read it in your book. I think people sometimes, they get trapped in the victim mindset and they feel sorry for themselves because of something that unfortunate that happened to them. And they don't realize that the only way to get out of that negative mind trap is to remove yourself from that situation and not see yourself as a victim. I had a bad day at work, right? Um, I don't see myself as a victim by any means. I don't sit there and say, why me, poor me, pity me, because it doesn't do me any good. And I'll be honest, what the bomb did for me was help me live without fear of trying new things. I mean, you know, on top of having all of, uh, like the, the speaking and the foundation, I, I actually, I decided I wanted to try businesses. So I got out of the military, started flipping houses with my father-in-law. Uh, after I got so many houses flipped, I bought a marina with a buddy and we went from 70 boat slips to 180 boat slips now. We have a cafe that was never there. We have rental boats um, and we have 38 rooms at cabins and cottages. And then next to that, my buddy and myself and two other guys started a restaurant. Now, uh, currently I'm putting in a distillery and a brewery um, that should open like the brewery will open like probably like May. And I just I think the most freeing thing to happen to me was was that IED. Now, if I can go back in time, I would definitely not have it hit me. I'd go back to my arms and legs, call it a day and live my life. But that's not the world we live in. Right. So understanding that I don't I don't worry about trying new things because you only get one chance at life. You might as well make the most of it. Um, I think helps me keep uh, keep pushing forward. You talk about the importance of a support system and having like, you know, good people around you as far as being able to recover and to essentially turn adversity into your advantage. And Jocko wrote the forward to your latest book. And he said that you're a hero of his, you're the most inspiring person he's ever come across. Talk about your, your friendship with Jocko. Like, what have you learned from him? What have you taught him? I mean, he's just a great guy. You can't ask for a better friend than Jocko. He's always willing to lend, you know, lend an ear to talk. He's always, he's also, he's a very good businessman. Um, so, you know, asking him for advice has been my go-to as well. Um, some mentorship, and I started doing some jujitsu with him, um, him and his all of his guys because I love chess. Right, my favorite game to play is chess. I play thousands of games a year uh, with uh, with my father-in-law and some other people, and I feel like jujitsu is like. A real life form of chess like you got to know what move to go where and when the which sh you know the weight shifts and all that but you know having Jocko there on my side and mentoring me and to help make no excuses sometimes I'll find myself you know I, like I'm, I'm not superhuman <laughs> right I'm not like I never have a bad day or I never have a bad mo I don't have bad days I have bad like, like I'll drop my phone and break my phone screen like everybody else and get upset about it but you know making sure I don't make excuses uh too much for myself um and understanding like how to how to change the narrative. So at my foundation, there's 35 employees. At the restaurant, there's 60 employees. My marina in the summer, there's like 30-some employees. And, you know, sometimes 
sometimes you got to have hard conversations. Just having his his guidance on how to have those hard conversations with people has really helped me because I'm not good at the conflict, which sounds weird, right? I'm a combat non commissioned officer. I've shot, you know, I've shot people and done all that stuff and been ruthless when I had to. But when it comes to like here, you know, here in the civilian world, I'm a little bit softer than I need to be probably at some times. So having him help me with those, those things have been, has been really tremendous for me. What would you say that he's learned from you? Well, that, you know, it's okay to laugh and smile every now and then, you know, be so serious. Uh, no, I mean, you know, I, just a give and take resiliency and, you know, he's been through a lot of adversity too in life, uh, you know, and, and things that he has going on. But I think it's cool. Like I get to be his friend as well. Like him and his business partner who lives by me is my good friend, Pete Roberts, who owns Origin and, and Jocko Fuel and all that stuff. Like he's the, the guy that created it. Um, you know, I think it's just cool to be their friends. Like they're not asking anything of me. I'm not asking anything of them besides for what normal friends do. And I think that's that's been like the coolest thing, you know. A lot of men are struggling with their mental health right now, whether they're coming back from the military, whether they're just, they're just living life in general. I think it's been challenging for men to open up about their emotions and talk about how they're truly feeling and talk about how they can actually grow, get better, heal in certain areas of their lives. What have you found to be helpful either working um, with the men through your foundation, just your friends, people in your your circle? Like, What's your message to the men out there that are struggling right now? Well, I mean, I tell people if they need help, they definitely get it. I mean, they don't just have these places and resources because uh, they want to have them. They have them because it's supposed to help. But again, I told you, I'm not the best at mental health the way that you're supposed to do it by the book. They gave me a social worker that I was supposed to go see once a week as part of my recovery at Walter Reed. And the first week I went in there, we talked a lot of, you know, football and joking around. And then she asked me a question, like a serious one. And I was the first one to be like, oh, nah, no, I'm not here for that. I'm here because the Army says I have to be here. I'm not here because I'm going to talk to you about this stuff. And by the second session, I said, look, this isn't the movies. Like, this, I'm not going to have like a sudden breakthrough. I said... We're wasting both of our time. So again, I got to be honest with you. I think I'm not the best advocate uh, with my actions because I didn't go the route that I uh, that people sh- you know normally that, that people should go. Um, and again, that was that was almost 12 years ago now that I did all that stupid stuff. But now I think you know finding people that you can relate to is huge. I think you know giving back and and having service in your life is is something as well. You know, not that you got to measure like people doing worse than you, but just finding a way to like give back and to volunteer your time and to join organizations that you can truly help with. I think it all helps with mental health. You know, I, I think what I tell people is they have these services out there. Why would you not use them? You'll never know if it's going to help you or not. And the reason like for this book, Bounce Back, right? People sometimes feel so isolated with what they have going on. Like, oh, nobody understands me. Nobody's going to get what I'm going through. And it's like people go through the same problems. Like we're not reinventing problems here, right? They're not. They're not reinvented. You know, someone's going through divorce. Somebody's been in a car accident. Someone has financial struggles. Someone has anxiety. It's, you know, it's it's. You might feel isolated and alone on the island, but you're not the only one going through it. And there are people out there that can help you. Go find the help, because there's no reason to live miserably and to be too prideful because the help is out there. And I think a big part of what people struggle with is the the role of like identity, right? When when you know, if like a guy goes through a divorce, you know, part of his identity is gone. If he leaves the military, part of his identity is gone. If he retires from a sport, leaves a career, etc., part of the identity is gone. I know a lot of your identity was wrapped up in your career as a military, as a leader, as a jock, right? As you said, looking at yourself now, if you were to describe your identity. As far as who you are today, what would that look like? Well, I think I'm still a leader, uh, which is nice. Uh, people, you know, uh, I always got really weird about being like, you know, 27, 28, um, 29. Like having people ask me for advice that are older than me or like being their boss. Now at 36 doesn't bother me, <laughs> you know. But but if you if you see me out with my daughter, like I'm never embarrassed of anything. Like my daughter um, and I will go out and we'll start dancing in public and singing. And I just don't let things get me down or bother me. I think that's the the best thing is I I try to teach people like don't don't be don't try to be too cool the people that always try to be too cool or to like I don't need help or I don't need this or I can't do that because it's embarrassing like you're not living life to the fullest just go out there and have fun I mean the thing you know it's stupid because like I hate the thing YOLO like I actually hate that but it's true it's true you only live once 
make the most out of it. I, this guy, Evan, is sitting behind the camera here. Straight up, was in college. And uh, my his buddy, who's my buddy, was like, hey, this guy's got talent. He can be your videographer. And I'm like, ah, oh, but he's in college. And then Evan's, you know, the videographer. He's like, look, my dream is more important than college right now. I want to come work for you, see how it works out. And I'm like, you're telling your mom and dad, because I'm not telling your mom and dad, Evan. And uh, his mom and dad are like, no, we want him to be happy and do what he wants to do. So he made the choice, like, instead of getting his, he has a semester and a half left of school. Like, I mean, a semester left. And he's like, I'll go back some other time. And he took this opportunity. Because if he wouldn't have, I would never hired him. And he wouldn't be working with me and be my friend. But I think people need to realize, like, they got to take chances in life. And you got to go after what you want. Because I think too many people get bogged down um, in thinking that there's, a, there's a set plan. And it, it just gets mundane and you get set in your ways. And then you look back at life and say, man, I wish I would have tried this. What's been like an unexpected blessing from all of this that's come for you, like as a parent specifically? Because I mean, I think, I feel like people would look at it and be like, well, you know, you're a parent to a, you know, you couldn't do certain things with your son that you could have if you had all your limbs or you couldn't do certain things with your daughter or et cetera, et cetera. But what have been some of these things that you didn't expect to be like really positive? You know, it's funny because whenever I'm in a room uh, at an event, like either my events or other events, and my, my family's there, they usually have the, me say something. They ask me a question. They make an announcement that I'm there. And I'm not sure if it's making me feel special or not, but I think my son, he's only six, like he gets a kick out. He's like, oh, look, that's my dad on stage. And I think that's pretty cool. Like I get to be a role model for my kids. I'm not like, how am I trying to put this? I never wanted to have my kids embarrassed because their dad's a robot, Right. So I've always put myself out there in front of everybody and, and, and done everything I had to do to be, you know. And now, usually in town um, or around this, you know, Maine or where, you know, wherever I go, the first thing is, like, you know, the guy that has a foundation, you know, uh, he owns a white duck, he, he, the restaurant. He has a restaurant down there. You know, Lakeside, like uh, the guy with no arms, no legs. Like the identifier for me usually has to go to the three to four to five before you get to the guy with no arms, no legs. And I think that's like one of the coolest things that I've been able to do is get people to look past my injuries and see me as uh, a father, uh, a husband, an entrepreneur, and the things that I do in the community rather than just my injuries. And, I th and the reason I'm saying that, not to my own horn, but I think my kids see that as like I'm a leader in the community. I think that's like the, the cool thing, right? Like because of my injuries, my kids get to see that no matter what adversity they're going to face in life or they go through, like you can overcome it and you can be respected, not because of norms no legs but respected for the things that you do if you work hard and you just keep at it and stay determined and dedicated to you know what your goals are what's your favorite thing to do for fun with your kids uh trampoline we jump on the trampoline a lot you know uh yeah i take my kids to school like oh i took my daughter to school today i'll pick my son up from school today she has a basketball game I, I just we do a lot of trampoline stuff and like wrestling around and uh, I love going to my daughter's games. My son hasn't really started sports yet. He's, I think he's going to do basketball this this winter, you know, and then just the chance to, to hang out with him. It's a lot of fun. Sorry, like I have a rule in my house. So if I get back from a speaking event, I do 150 days on the road a year. But when I say 150, like I might fly out Monday afternoon, so I take my kids to school. And I'll speak Tuesday morning, fly back in the afternoon, and I'll, you know, have dinner or put them to bed. So it's like two days considered, but I, I see them both days. But if I get home at 1, 2, 3 in the morning, Plane got delayed, whatever. If they wake me up at six, I get up. I can sleep some other time. I'm fine with that. And that's like my one thing I've always been really dedicated to. No matter what time I get home, if they wake me up, I get up. As far as like your health and fitness goes, I know it was a challenge for you to get back into working out. What has health and fitness done for you overall? I mean, I know you're not a big mental health guy, but I would imagine it's helped your mental health. It's, it's, I imagine it's helped your self-confidence. How important has that been for you? Well, I'll tell you what, as far as physical fitness lately not much um but i put a new gym in my house my wife uses it all the time on her peloton and i've done three workouts in there because we posted three times on instagram from there so i know i've done at least three things in there because you know you gotta do it for the gram but uh, but unfortunately i need to get back on that horse that's why i started the whole jujitsu stuff and uh i got the total now which i, I need to get back at working at but but, you know, the endorphins get released um, and things like that. Like, that's that's where it's at. I would want to get fit because I'm right now muscular. You know, after the holiday season, we'll probably get after it. Maybe today. You know, you never know. I'm on that manana diet. I've been doing that for a while now. doesn't seem to be working because I'm always going to start tomorrow. And, and I, I like, um, like you said, mental, like, you know, I, I believe 
and mental toughness and mental strength. I, I am not saying I don't believe in mental health um, stuff. I just, I, I think I play, I play a lot of chess. I think it keeps my mind sharp. I fortunately have a lot of uh, people that I get to talk to at all the businesses I'm a part of. So that way I keep my, keep myself ready to fix any problem that pops up. And then I'm also married 15 plus years. So, you know, that takes a toll on making sure that I say the right things. Don't make her mad. I don't want to get put in the closet with my arms and legs taken away. You know, that's, <laughs> that's sad when that happens, but. With all that said, I know you, you say that you have to like, you want to get back on the health and fitness train. You got this gym, you got the tonal, you got the Peloton. But I do know that it seems like when you started to work out with that guy, David, it was very instrumental for you, right? Because you were like, you felt like you were getting back on a, the right path. It was, but it was also, it was community too, right? Like I moved to Texas where I had nobody but my family, which, which I love my family. That's not the point I'm trying to make here. David worked for Clint Bruce of Trident Securities and Clint Bruce was a Navy SEAL who now has like a private security, you know, thing he was doing. And David was not in the nonprofit world. He had a gym called Performance Vault and he would train all the private sector security guys. And the, the cool thing was like when he was doing all that, He's like, hey, come work out. And I said, all right, cool. I'll come work out. So then I went and worked out. And then I got to meet all those guys that were military, that were, you know, all this stuff. And I got that community back. So community is a huge thing for me, you know, having friends and, and people to talk with. As far as like your headspace, and I know you're obviously in a completely different headspace now than you were, you know, t 10 years ago. But I've heard you say you still every once in a while will have these negative thoughts and rumination about certain things. And I think that can really trip people up where now a bad 20 minutes of thinking turns into a bad hour, two hours, two days, two weeks. And now all of a sudden you're completely spun out, essentially just, just wasted a bunch of time. How do you navigate that? Like when you're getting ruminating thoughts about your past, what are some things that, that help you? Like I'll sit there some nights uh, and I, crazy enough, it hasn't happened recently. I can remember, like the camera last time, but I'd sit there and I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is my life. I have no arms and legs. I'm like, why would this be my life? It would irritate me. Like, I can't believe this is my, like what happened to me. Like, why me? Whatever. But seriously, when those thoughts creep in for me, it's always like at nighttime in the dark before I fall asleep, nothing going on. It's all quiet. Everybody else is sleeping. And all I do is hop in my, uh, my wheelchair because my legs are off for the day. I go jump on the couch and I just turn on sports center, take my mind off it. Um, tell myself I can't change it. And I think the biggest thing that I've had, and this is probably over the last, I'd say over the last year, um, which is crazy, right? Because I'm almost on 12 years of being injured, um, is acceptance. Like I accepted that I got blown up, but I still, you know, every now and then, like I have those thoughts, a little bitter, like what the heck, why? Uh, but for me now, acceptance is huge. Like I accept I have no arms and legs. You know, even I thought it was funny, actually, uh, I only put it as daydreaming, I guess, even though it was like last night, I was in my bed thinking about a scenario some business I want to do and stuff like that. And I was like, I was thinking about it and I was like, oh my gosh, even in my scenarios now I have prosthetics. Like I have, you know what I mean? Like I don't see myself with arms and legs and stuff like that. Cause I was in my head laughing about it this, uh, this morning. I was like, geez, I, I even forgot what it's like to have natural arms and legs as I was like going through my daydream. You know what? I'm not really saying this the right way, but I did chuckle about it today. Just so you know, for me, I, it, accepting that I'll never find out the answer why this happened. And to stop asking why it happened, because no answer is ever going to suffice. It's never going to be like, oh, that makes sense. That's right. And when I realized it was never going to make sense to me, it was never going to be an okay answer. Then I had to just accept this is my life. As harsh as this might sound, it's like, this is my life. Deal with it. That's just where, that's where I cut it off at. I'm just dealing with it and I'm dealing with it the best I can. And I've been fortunately pretty successful with, with having that mindset of like, this is how it is. Let's go. And so talk about the relationship with your wife, because I know at the beginning of all this, you pretty much told her to, to, to walk away and take everything. And she stuck by you and supported you and helped you get through all of that. Yeah, I think a lot of that was obligation. And nowadays, you know, she what people think bad of her. Nowadays, my social media following is pretty big. So I'm like, if you ever leave, I'll ruin you. So she stays <laughs> reluctantly. <laughs> but uh, no, she's been a rock through the whole thing, to be honest with you. And my only job in the beginning was like, okay, how do I make sure that I'm not a burden? How's my wife going to not be a caregiver and actually be my spouse? And I need help, right? I'm not going to sit here and pretend like I don't need help with my legs on the right way, my pants on the right way, like with a button, my arm on the right way. But once I get those on, I'm pretty independent. Like, I, I mean, I do okay. Where like, like I went to the grocery store, right? Yesterday, I went and grabbed all the groceries yesterday. I took 
Chloe to school today. I'll pick her up. Like, I made dinner, right? I mean, I've had some help. Evan's hands helped me with the turkey on the smoker, but I did make some pretty awesome dinner last night. Um, but it's like my big thing was if she's going to stay, it's not going to be this caregiver patient relationship, right? I'll need help with some things and we'll have to accept that. But the things I can actually do, even if it takes me longer, I'm going to do because I need her to be my, my spouse and my partner in life, not, not my nurse. Last question for you. Gratitude, I know is a big thing for you. What's the biggest thing as you're looking back now? Like, what are you most grateful for given everything that's happened to you in your life? I have no favorites. That needs to be said in case my kids ever listen to this back. But if my daughter Chloe was not born or in the world at that time, no way would I be sitting here talking to you. Not a chance. Not like in a suicidal way. Not in a like, I wouldn't, you know, I'm just saying without her by my side, without her learning how to walk with me, without her being there to ride around my wheelchair and talk to all the people. And like at nighttime, give my wife a break. I would buckle her into my wheelchair and me and her would drive around the hospital and all that stuff and say hi to people. And people knew Chloe just as well as they knew me, you know, and she'd go get grapes with me or cookies from the, the cafeteria at night. But I would say the thing I'm most grateful for in my recovery is that I had Chloe because without my daughter, my life would not, not be anywhere near this. As a matter of fact, and humbly as I can say that, it's just the truth. Does she know that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we had our gala, um, the first gala we ever had for our foundation. And I said, look around this place. You know, I was all like teary-eyed, like a little, little, you know, whiny, cry person. But I was like, look around this place. You want to know the truth? I said, you might as well call it Chloe Lynn because that's what this place is. I got to get, get the chance to like help families and build stuff like this with other people helping me, right? Not by myself, but because of the gift that Chloe was during my recovery and to help my family get through. So, yeah, I, I, yeah she knows. She always says she's my favorite. I'm like, you're my favorite daughter. She was your favorite dad, your favorite altogether for kids. I'm like, yeah, favorite daughter for sure. hundred percent. Incredible story, man. Incredible wisdom and just insights and just how you're, a you're able to kind of bring this all full circle. It's, it's quite inspiring. So I wanted to thank you so much for coming on here. I think the audience is going to get a lot of value out of our conversation. Um, if they want to connect with you further, if they want to learn more about the foundation, if they want to buy your books, where's the best place to do all that? Type in bounce back on Amazon. It pops up Barnes and Noble, you know, sold everywhere as well as if you want to find out more about me and my foundation, just my website, travismills.org or travismillsfoundation.org. And then follow me on Instagram and Facebook and uh, TikTok and all the fun stuff uh, at SSG Travis Mills. Thanks for letting me plug that, by the way. Appreciate it. Of course, man. Well, thank you again for coming on the show. This has been awesome. I think once again, the audience is going to get a lot of value out of it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.